Okay, we're rolling. This is a home interview, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 27th of October, 2004, approximately 9.45 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, Norman Charles Trudell, uh, born in Burlington, Vermont, November 29th, 1926. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Was, uh, let me say, high school. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you call it? The uh, equivalency. Got equivalency through Ellenberg Central High School. Mm -hmm. okay. So high school diploma. And plus, that was it at that time, yes. Well, that came later. But at the time I entered, the service. I had left school at, as a sophomore, and so it's second year high. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was on a farm in northern New York. My brother, Eddie, was at Pearl Harbor, so it was uh, quite a shock. Now, was he in the Army or Navy? Navy. Navy. Was he on a ship at Pearl Harbor? Yeah, he was on the USS Curtis. Okay. Um, so you felt it was a shock to you? Oh, well, definitely. How did you hear about it? Do you radio. Okay. By, by the radio. All right. Um, did you enlist or, or were you drafted? I, uh, well, there was no draft for the Marine. Right, right. Uh, so it, I enlisted, yes. Why did you decide to join the Merchant Marines? Well, I was at home. I had an uncle come home on leave and uh, told him I had tried to join the Navy, but they wouldn't take me because I had one blind eye. And he says, Norm, don't be crazy. He said, join the Merchant Marine. And that was the first inkling I had that there was such a thing as the Merchant Marine. Mm -hmm. It was news to me, and so I followed through, and I did join the March Marine at 17 years. Now, did your months. parents have to sign for you? Yes, or? yes, my mother had to mm -hmm. sign a release. Mm -hmm. Was she happy about you going, or, <laughs> or not so happy? Not so happy. Okay. Well, my brother Eddie was in the Navy, my brother Bob was in the Air Corps. And I said, well, gee, Eddie and Bob are gone. I should be able to go, too. So she did sign a release. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, where did you go after you signed? Uh... Well, I lived in Burlington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to go to Boston. I traveled to Boston. At, that was about the only recruiting station I knew. So it was on 77 Milk Street, if memory serves me right, in Boston. And I passed the physical because they, they weren't too fussy about, uh, let me say, that they were looking for bodies more than physiques, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I, I did, I passed the physical, took the papers back home to Burlington. My mother signed a release. Went back to Boston, and uh, the recruiter asked me, he says, well, when, when do you want to go? I said, well, it's now too soon. And he says, no, we have a group going to New York this afternoon. So uh, I believe we went by train, if I recall. And I ended up at Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. That was the Maritime uh, Training Center. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to specify, the maritime service was under jurisdiction of the Coast Guard. And on top of both of that was the War Shipping Administration that was in charge of everything, I believe. And during training, it was under jurisdiction of the Coast Guard. After training, when we actually got into Merchant Marine, that was working for private companies, for shipping companies. And uh, that was the end of the maritime service. But from then on, we were merchant mariners. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of training did you receive 
And well, how long was it? It was about three month training, about a 12 week training. And it was survival. It was a uh, life ball practice, uh, gymnastics, swimming, and uh, a very little uh, in uh, study. Of, well, we studied compass, compass points, parts of the ship, and uh, very, very little uh, <laughs> of the curriculum was, was on, uh, well, on study, basically. Mm -hmm. Did you get any kind of weapons training at all? We trained very little with a 5-inch 38, if you... The 5-inch 38 is a, a, a recoil, a piece of artillery that was usually on the stern of merchant ships. Mm -hmm. On most uh, merchant ships, it was a 5-inch 38 on a, on, a, on a stern and a 3-inch 50, which was a, a rifle type uh, on a bow. And that, on most of those ships, that's all we had. Okay, but you didn't get any kind of rifle training or No, no, none of that. Just, uh, now, did you have armed guard members on the ship? On some of the ships had armed guard, <coughs> yeah. And they were the, more or less the better ships were where they had quarters to accommodate armed guard. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was on, the first two ships I was on, there was no armed guard. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the crew members themselves? That we, uh, yeah, that uh, <laughs> we played with the, with the artillery, yes. It wasn't too serious. I don't think we could have hit a barn if there was one out there. What were your quarters like on the ship? Well, depending on a ship, the first first ship I was on, they, they weren't very good. The first ship I was on was the SS Annabelle, uh, the WSA took us from the uh, shipping uh, shipping out office, and uh, there was three or four of us from there that uh, they put a, on the SS Cannibal. Uh, Annabelle, rather, and uh, it was a ship owned by Mystic Steamship Company. It was built in 1918, and it was a coal burner, one of the last coal burners on the East Coast, where they use coal for cooking in a galley, mm -hmm. as well as for <laughs> for power, for, and we also carried coal. The main thing was back then you, you have to realize that with the war effort on, the railroads were so busy, there was no accommodation for additional coal, so these ships were quite important, uh, supplying these cities in the Boston area and, and uh, other, you know, further north and south. Now, were these ships steam powered? This was coal, yeah, it was the steam, the coal generating the steam, yes. Okay. And uh, so our, the first, well, this particular ship, we didn't have radar, we didn't have a gyro compass, all we had was a magnetic compass, which was, let me say, not very efficient. Uh, the crew was very inexperienced, the captain was, I, I don't believe the captain was very experienced either because we had two problems with the magnetic compass that we wouldn't have with a gyro compass. On the East Coast, there's a, a, about 11 degree variation from true north to magnetic north. And we having a magnetic compass, I don't believe he realized the difference. So the first trip I was on going south, we ran into a sandbar somewhere off the New Jersey coast is what I suspect. And we did manage to wiggle our way off from the sandbar and headed towards Newport News, Virginia. And from there, on these coal burners, the, uh, the problem was the firemen on a, on a turbine uh, the firemen, all they had to do was turn valves 
on a coal burner and they had to shovel coal. Mm -hmm. And we had the privilege of signing off uh, as any time we hit an American port, we could sign off. And what would happen as soon as we hit a port, the engine crew would sign off. So we'd have to wait for another crew, usually a week, two weeks. So that was the problem with, with the coal burners. Well, on this particular ship, the captain, like I say, we hit a sandbar going south, which would automatically steer us quite a ways off, off true, true south or wherever we were going. So we did make that one trip from Newport News and we ended up north of Boston, somewhere, I don't know the city. The next trip we headed south again, uh, going through Cape Cod Canal. We had to wait our turn going through the canal. I was on a wheel going through the canal and as soon as we broke out of it, as one might watch ended, that was four o'clock in the afternoon. And I was down in my quarters at 5.32, we collided with a tanker. Now there again is what I say is wrong because that 11 degrees off brought us into where we shouldn't be because this, this uh, tanker was anchored out there because of the soup, pea soup fog. So we collided with the tanker on a port bow. And the next thing, well, when I heard the word collision, I put on my life jacket, went up on deck, and the first thing that hit, I saw one glimpse of the ship. The next thing I saw was smoke and fire. So I headed back down the ladder. And it was about six or seven of us all trying to get air, fresh air, and as soon as we get up on deck and we get hit with another blast of fire. So I ended up on a bottom pile twice and uh, I thought, the heck with this. So I headed down an alleyway or passageway forward. Uh, this was on a Coastwise Collier primarily and there's a poop deck on the back on the stern. So that, that was the quarters primarily. So I, I went over from, I went forward and then crossed over to the port side. Then as I was going back, I was going by feel, I couldn't see anything any, anymore. The smoke was so thick. And uh, when I was halfway down that alleyway, I heard the abandoned ship whistle blow. So I got out to the deck uh, on the aft and I, I reached around and there was a ladder there and I, I was completely, I couldn't remember a ladder being there. I, I thought I was outside on deck and so anyway I climbed the ladder, started reaching around, feeling around and I was in the aft gun tub, in a 5 inch 38 gun tub. And I didn't want to be there. There's no protection there. So I couldn't find a ladder to come back down. So I hung over the edge of the gun tub and dropped down to the deck. I was worried about breaking a leg or something, but I didn't. I was, I was lucky. So then I worked myself forward on the port side of the ship. Everything was a fire, the rails, the overhead, the bulkhead. But I was working myself forward and I got to a point and there was some, a bunch of fellows trying to lower a lifeboat. Well, these, on this ship is what they call a cradle type davit. And to raise a lifeboat you have a, a block and tackle or the rope or the line. So we started raising the lifeboat and the line started fire and the boat dropped back on deck. So then I looked further and there was some fellows trying to launch a life raft. And that's what really surprised me because 
they didn't know how to launch a life raft on a boat. I mean, they, I don't know where they came from. They were very, they weren't sailors. They were just on a ship doing a job. So I gave them the word. I said, well, look over the side. If there's a clearing, give me a holler and I'll launch the raft. And so I got the word, well, there's a clearing. And so I kicked the raft off, which was, I don't know how familiar you are with a pelican hook. You kick the ring off and the hook opens up and the raft goes over. So I looked over the edge and there was a clearing there. The rail was a fire and like a darn fool, I, I didn't want to catch my clothes on fire. I used my hands to put the fire out. I had really burned both hands. But I did. I jumped after the raft. I was the only one. And it wasn't long before the raft started a fire. The flames were about 30 feet high. I couldn't see the ship at all anymore. And uh, it seems it was a, from what I've heard later, there was a six knot current going out. And that evidently, uh, the raft stopped the, the fire to some degree as, and it left the clearing behind it. And uh, so I stayed on that raft as long as I could. I covered my face pretty good. Pretty soon it just got too hot and I had to leave the raft. And I swam along this, there was an open channel that the, the raft evidently had provided for me. And I got to where it was, the fire was only about three, four feet, uh, feet high. So I swam through that with not much problem. Got into another clearing and there was another raft out there and there was one man on it. That was the first mate and uh, I ran, swam up to it. I was exhausted, froze. and uh, So anyway, I got up to the raft and he helped me up on a raft. Now at this time it was getting dark and uh, so by hollering, it seems that there was another ship in, nearby, an English ship, when they heard all the whistles blowing and so forth. They, they uh, launched a, a, a boat, a lifeboat, to search for survivors. So they picked us up from the raft and brought us onto the ship. <laughs> It was the first time I looked in the mirror, I was as black as <laughs> it was I could not recognize myself. I was cold black. And uh, so the captain uh, of the ship came down and I had taken off my life jacket and put it on the deck and he came by and picked it up and that thing was so porous, I mean it was probably Built in 1918 at the time of the ship because it was, you know, it was almost rotted and it was actually pulling me down rather than helping me float. So I was lucky I, I made it to the raft. So anyway, from there they transferred us to a Coast Guard cutter and from getting up on a cutter, the, uh, the fellows told me, told me there was a few of us that uh, transferred from the Coast Guard, uh, from the, no, there was only two of us on, a, on the English ship to the cutter and getting onto the cutter. I was told, be careful where you step because there's bodies there and there was quite a few bodies lined up, which was a terrible feeling that, you know, they hadn't made it. And uh, from there, they brought us to a hospital in New Bedford, Mass. And we stayed, I stayed overnight in New Bedford. They bandaged my arms and my hands. And uh, went back to New York. And the Coast Guard was having an uh, investigation on the whole thing, so we were still assigned to the ship. The ship did not sink. It was towed into Bethlehem uh, Boatyard in Brooklyn. 21st Street, I believe it was. The Normandy was in the same same area that had burned. If you 
You, you might be too young to remember the Normandy. Read about it, yeah. And uh, that was in the same shipyard. And so we were, I was there maybe one or two weeks while the investigation was going on. And uh, we were still assigned to the ship, but there's no way we could stay on it. But that's where we stayed. Uh, there was a gin mill close by, which was handy. And uh, that one of my gripes was the abandoned ship whistle. In training, the training was six or more short and one long. It's abandoned ship. And the <laughs> lieutenant or somebody in the Coast Guard says, well, he asked me what it was. I said, six or more short and one long. He says, no. He said, it's seven short and one long. And to this day, I can't imagine anybody continuing with that type of abandoned ship. Right? To me, two shorts and a long a series of them, you would know immediately that you're going to be in an abandoned ship. But nobody can tell me you're going to wait while you're on fire or smothering to count seven shorts. You know, it, mm -hmm. well, it blew my mind. So anyway, that was the end of that ship. Uh, how many uh, survived that were in the ship? I was told 11. Out of how I, many? I really don't know what the, I suspect somewhere in the 40s. Were you carrying any type of cargo on board? No, this we were light. We were going headed south. Okay. Our, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah we, we had unloaded north of Boston and headed south to pick up another load of coal. Now, do, do you know if that ship, uh, they they repaired it and reused no, it again? No, no, that's it's not even on the internet. They don't even. They don't even recognize it on the internet. They recognize the next ship I was on, and and more or less has some of the information from the from the Annabelle to the. Uh, oh, I got, I've got it written down here. I think the next ship. Mangor. Uh, Mango. Uh, is it the Mangor? Yeah, that's a sister ship to the. Uh, to the animal, the same, same size, same a coal carrier. So it must have been built about the same time then. 1916, 19. <coughs> on a Mangor, the Annabelle was 1918. Now, do you remember the company that owned the ships? Mystic, that was Mystic Steamship Lines. Okay. And uh, that, uh, there again, I had a gripe with the Coast Guard. I got on that ship, and there was more cockroaches. It was so so infested; it was terrible. But to try and get used to sleeping when you know cockroaches are running all over you is something you have to get used to. But uh, I did manage to sleep after a few days. So I stayed on that ship on a Mangor. I don't remember maybe two or three or four trips back and forth. And uh, the, I know I was down there in Newport News where we had loaded up and uh, went out to the uh, bay, had to anchor waiting for another crew. Temperature was 104 degrees. <laughs> so I along with a couple of other fellows, we thought, well, we'd at least go swimming. So we were dove off the ship and swimming outside, and the captain came out on a wing, and he more or less told us no swimming on this ship, and so we had to get back on board. So the next day was still 104 degrees, and the chief engineer was a very good swimmer. So I said, Chief, if I fall overboard, will you follow me? Or will you come and get me? He says, you're damn right I will. <laughs> so I went overboard, he came overboard, and then pretty soon the rest of us, the rest of the guys went over. Captain came out again and started hollering, and then he saw the chief engineer, and he got quiet and 
went back in his quarters. So that was some relief from the temperature down there. You'd be on a hot ship on 104 degrees and no air conditioning. Quarters are quite crowded. So anyway, I stayed on that, like I said, three or four trips. And I sort of got tired of that type ship, so I had heard that Standard Oil uh, had their own ships. And uh, so I thought, well, if I get on, on a different kind of a ship, uh, I heard tankers were, were cleaner. But uh, WSA wasn't handling uh, the tankers. Uh, they had their own crews, basically. So when I got to New York, I went down Lower Broadway to the offices of Standard Oil. And uh, they informed me they had their own crew, their own crews, and suggested I go down, try at city service uh, offices down there. Now, city services, uh, I think, is Sitco today. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was quite, it was a large company. They had their own refinery down in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. So I went into the office at city service, and uh, he said, yeah, we need one more crew man. Uh, uh, there's a ship in Hoboken waiting for another member. So he said, grab a cab and go over. Right? <laughs> I said, you got cab money? He said, no, we don't furnish cab money. So I said, well, I'll take a subway. So I got on that ship, and uh, it was basically home port was Jacksonville, Florida. After I got on, I realized I was the only Yankee on board. And boy, they, well, they were still fighting the Civil War. So I was treated quite, uh, I was unwelcome, but I did serve. I, Took one trip with him. Went down to uh, Louisiana, came back to Hoboken, and I signed off there. And at that time, I I had to go home. Well, uh, my stepfather had a farm in northern New York. They were looking for, well, there was no help, so he asked me to go and help with the crops. So I did that. And the next ship I got on was the SS Richards, I believe. I, I don't remember where I picked that up. I think it might, must have been in Boston. And uh, that was a clean ship. It was, I believe, a Liberty ship. I'm not sure if it was built as a Liberty ship or if it was uh, built previously, but uh, it was the same, same style as a Liberty ship. So I got on that, and we headed towards, uh, it was an island near Tampa Bay, Florida, of Boca Grande. We picked up a load of phosphate, and that, actually that was 4th of July when, when we were down there, because we shot off some of the flares and we were reprimanded by the Coast Guard that they weren't, for, they weren't firecrackers. So that, I got back up to Baltimore on that ship and uh, unloaded there. And for some reason, I, I went back home because, to the farm. And while the crops were done, I headed back towards Boston again. Can I ask a question? Yes. Being in the Merchant Marine Service, you were able to transfer from ship to ship if you wished or just go home for a while and come back? You, yeah, yeah. You we, had that freedom of choice? Yeah, we didn't. It was, uh, every trip we went on was a contract. Every American port we hit, we had the privilege of signing off that ship. Now, what was your actual job and responsibility? It was uh, seaman, uh, ordinary seaman on some of the ships and, and eventually AB seamen, which was able-bodied seamen. Mm -hmm. It was deck department. Now, on a merchant ship, you have three three groups. You have deck, engine, and mess. In a deck department, uh, for each watch, well, I think this is quite common. There's three three watches 
uh, per ship, basically 12 to 4, 4 to 8, and 8 to 12. That's morning and night, a.m., p.m. In a deck department, we had two A.B. seamen and one ordinary seaman, plus one officer, which was a first, second, or third mate. Of course, the captain was head of all of it. Engine department was something different. That was chief engineer and uh, usually a fireman, oiler, wiper. But on the coal burning ships, you had to have coal passes. In other words, uh, they had to transfer the coal from the from the bends to the to the boilers where where the firemen had to shovel coal there. So anyway, on this next ship. No, I, that was on a Richards. I, I had signed off in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. I went back home, helped with the crops. I got on another ship, and I believe it had to be through the WSA in, uh, in, <laughs> in Boston. And that was, uh, if I remember right, it was the SS Kane. It was a uh, Liberty ship equipped to pick up troops out of uh, Europe and that was owned by American Export Company. So I got on that ship and headed towards France which was finally what I wanted because I wanted what, what we used to call deep sea instead of coastwise. Even though coastwise was a lot more dangerous during a war than deep sea was because uh, once you were out deep sea, you weren't very likely to be to be found. So anyway, we sailed to France. I got on that ship. I think it was in November, and uh, North Atlantic in the winter time is the worst place in the world to be. So we finally did get over to uh, La Havre, France, and picked up. Uh, it was 500 and some odd uh, soldiers from the, I think it was the 101st Air, uh, Transportation Group that uh, we picked up. Do you remember what year that was? That was 45. 45, okay. It uh, was after, after v, v and I, it was after VJ Day as well. So we, it was so rough on the way over, it was, uh, let me say, quite hazardous, really, for any ship. It doesn't matter how, how bad or how big they are. Queen Mary was in was North Atlantic that, at that time, and they, they were damaged. So it, uh, it happened to everybody. So on the way back, after we loaded the, the troops, we headed back towards the, uh, towards the States, took the southern route back, uh, passed by the Azores. And when we got to Boston, uh, well, we broke down twice on the way back, come to think of it. <laughs> and I was on the uh, 12 to 4 watch on, on that ship. I was an AB, and the mainmast light went out. I don't know if, how familiar you are with the lights on a ship, but the mainmast light is quite. <laughs> <laughs> necessary. It's the highest light, and then if there's two lights, the main mast is higher than the next light. That way, you can tell which direction the ship is going at night. So I was up on a mast, and uh, <coughs> the captain was hollering up with, through his megaphone. And on top of the mast, there was a flagpole, and that's where the light was on top of the flagpole. He says, "Shimmy up." <laughs> I said, no, shimmy hell, I'm not going up there. This is 50 feet on top of the mast, and then there's a, a flagpole on top of that. But I think he was kidding, because I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we there was a way to lower the flagpole and, and fix the light. <laughs> so from there on, we got to Boston. And uh, the bosun was also the Union steward. And ordinarily, when you had an American port, you have 
the privilege of signing off, but this was on the 20th of December. And most of the crew was out of Boston and they didn't want to go on to New York. So he came up with the, the ship was not seaworthy to go on to New York. And port, port engineer came on board and said the ship is seaworthy, so you fellows can sail. So then he came up with another, he said, well, the final port of discharge, we have a right to sign off. So then the port commander came on board and he said, gentlemen, I'm ordering you to sail because New York is going to be the final port of discharge where we can unload the ballast. So if you don't sail, I'm going to charge you with mutiny. <laughs> so I had been through the Coast Guard hearings with the, with the first ship, and so I said, well, I'm ready to sail. So I walked out of the mess hall. I was the only one walked out. <laughs> so the next morning in the paper was a ship, picture of the ship, mutiny ship. <laughs> So I was the only one that didn't mutiny. So that was the end of my... Well, what did they eventually do with the crew? They they took their papers. You can't sail without without Siemens papers. So they, they gathered all the papers. And what, what happened from to them from mm -hmm. then on, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, <coughs> that was a... You know, except there's a few things that are interesting happened on these some of these cruises, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Were there any blacks in the merchant service while you were only in the mess ship? department? Mm -hmm. uh, that was the uh, CC. Wait a minute. SS Seafarers International Union uh, had blacks, mm -hmm. and they were only in their mess department. Did you have any on the ships you not, served? Not the one, because I was, uh, most of the ship, uh, they were National Maritime Union, mm -hmm. or they were non-union, like the Mystic Steamship Lines were non-union, and there were no blacks. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, I'm sorry. Yes, there was blacks. We did have blacks on, on the first two ships. I'm sorry, I, I didn't remember that. I should have remembered because some of those poor guys had come on board with their possessions in a paper sack and uh, they, they were coal passes down in the engine room that, you know, transferred the coal from, from their bands to their furnaces and uh, that was the only blacks. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the Seafires International Union was the only one. The Mystic Steamship Line was not Union, but the others were Union, and so there were no blacks on it. That, that was the difference. Now, one thing that most landlubbers don't realize, and know, all through life, people I talked to didn't understand the belt system on board a ship. Now, uh, the belts, every half hour is a belt. In other words, at 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. That's a transfer watch, so it's eight belts and all's well. So at 12.30, it's one bell, 1 o'clock is two belts, 2.33, and so forth and so on. So it has nothing to do with the time, time of day. It's just one bell, two bells, three bells, and if you're on that watch, you know what time it is. So at eight bells, that's a changeover of the watch. It's at eight bells, eight bells and all's well, and you change over the watch. So that's what most most people don't understand, the system of the bells. Now, were you ever allowed any GI Bill of Rights? Uh... Not until a year ago. A year ago, okay. Now you're finally getting a pension. Now, were you ever... Uh... Oh, I, I do get a pension from New York State for being a blind veteran. Mm -hmm. It's about to $1,000 a year. It was 500 in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that came about, about 1995 or so. Were you ever allowed to retroactively look for, a, like, a purple heart for your burns or anything like no, that? No, you weren't no. allowed to give it Well, I, I didn't. I didn't know the Merchant Marines were... 
I was going to say that probably didn't happen because of enemy action. Right? Yeah. No. That's true. I didn't hear about that. Uh -huh. um, did you uh, stay in contact with anyone that was on the ships? Any of the ships with you? Only or? once. Uh, I ran, ran across a fella. He came from Barry, Vermont, and uh, I believe he was on the SS Richards, if memory serves me right. And uh, he was evidently a stone cutter in Barry, Vermont. And in my travels, I stopped by to see him one time. That was the only one. Mm -hmm. and, now, uh, have you been able to, or did you join any veterans organizations once you were I'm, able uh, to? Yeah, I'm in the American Legion. Yeah. How do you think uh, your time while you were in the Merchant Marine had an effect or changed your life at all? I can't, can't imagine how. It's just that I was so anxious. I was just anxious for adventure, basically, is what it amounted to. And, and uh, I was happy to be there. Do you think you would have been able to do those things if you didn't? Go into the no, service at all? No, positively not. I I enjoyed traveling. I went through New York City, a lot New York City, and walked Boston, and the major cities like Philadelphia. You know, I went through, and I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed the Merchant Marine, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, didn't didn't think of the danger. That basically, I suppose there was some danger, but. Thank God it was on these two uh, old ships. I don't think they were worth a torpedo. So I, I think that's why they stayed afloat. Now, your two brothers, did they survive the war? Oh, yeah. Eddie retired <laughs> at 38 years old. He's been getting his pension. Right now he's 81. So he's been, he was chief, chief petty officer when he left. And he also wrote programs before he retired on, for the Navy on psycholo psychological uh, part of uh, command, basically. So he was uh, he wrote the programs and then uh, worked at them, mostly in San Diego. Now, was he in the Pacific for most of the World War? He was in the Pacific for just about all of it. Yeah. How about your brother that was in the Army Air Corps? He uh, he was in the South Pacific. He was. Uh, Flying C 47s, and uh, at one time he was the uh, Admiral's pilot. I had an uncle that was in Wake Island, he was a doctor on Wake Island, and he used to, if it was, if it was possible, he would swing around and pick him up and go to Manila. But uh, yeah, he was, Bob, my Bob retired well. After the war, he went back to college and uh, took up geez, <laughs> ground control, uh, ground landing control. It was, uh, I forgot what the three letters were. Uh, but anyway, air, air traffic control? Yeah, basically, it's, uh, it was the electronic uh, grounding or landing control. Mm -hmm. And he was in Korea they, after college. They shipped him to Korea. He was in a reserve. And from Korea, he, uh, well, he stayed in after Korea. And he went to Denmark. And then he, they transferred him to the intelligence. Retired as a lieutenant colonel. So both your brothers stayed in the service yeah. for quite yeah. a while. And my kid brother was with NASA. He was in, a, in the Army for two years. And uh, first he went with GE, and uh, from there to uh, Bell, Air, Bell Laboratories in uh, in New Jersey. From there he joined NASA, and he was with NASA all his all, all his career. And uh, he, uh, like I say, he developed that uh, search and rescue, and. Uh, he, uh, there's quite a few th thousand lives that he saved. Okay, well, and then I had a sister that joined the Air Corps. Oh, really? So there was five of us. Uh, okay. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Oh, you're very welcome.